Welcome everyone back to our fourth video in the Poetics Book class for the spring semester of 2020. Um, this class we're looking at right now is the Song of Solomon. We began last week with it. And we find a very important book of the Bible. And it's important because of the, the content of it, the meaning that we find in this book. Uh, we find two people, a husband and wife, a Shulamite and Solomon. Uh, how that uh, she was a slave to her own family, therefore she had very little self-worth in her mind. Uh, Solomon had grown up, of course, in the palace, had uh, wealth unknown at that point so much, even before he became king. Uh, so you, you have two completely different backgrounds here. But in these backgrounds you have the same problem. Uh, and the problem is both of them show feelings of inadequacy. Uh, we see this not so much met with Solomon in this book, but we go back to 1 Kings chapter 3 and uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 1 when Solomon first became king upon the death of his father. Uh, he felt inadequate. He realized at that point when he became king that he could not, couldn't do this. Uh, he went to Gibeon to offer up sacrifices to, at his inauguration uh, as to be king. God comes to him and Ask him what it is that he wants, and Solomon's response is a very good response when he realizes, he tells God, he said, yeah, Lord, I, I'm but a child. I don't know how to go out and come in. I don't know how to judge your people. I, I can't do this. And so he asked God for an understanding heart, he asked for, for wisdom. And God gives him the wisdom, the ability to do what he needs to do as king here. Well, in the marriage situation here with Song of Solomon and Shulamite, He's young at this time. Uh, I, I know he's not the best picture of what a husband ought to be. When we look at 700 wives plus princes as concubines as well. Uh, but that's not important. That This uh, book of Song of Solomon is a picture of marriage as given by God on what a marriage should be. Not as Solomon as, as the one who gives us these examples. So forget about Solomon as far as the other wives and all that. Look at the, the picture that is painted in this book for us uh, and how important it is to see the, the interaction between this husband and wife. Uh, how that the Shulamite begins this book with so much inadequacies in, in her mind. Uh, like I say, mistreated by her family for years. Uh, her Worked for her mother, worked for her brothers, worked for her sister. Uh, no mention of her father in this book. We don't know what happened there. But nevertheless, a, a, a very dysfunctional family right here. And she's been basically abused by her family for however many years that this may be. Uh, so she feels insecure. Even though she ends up marrying Solomon, uh, she still has these feelings of inadequacy. Uh, Solomon, uh, you know, we... We carry a lot of things in our, our heart that we don't reveal to other people. Uh, maybe good, maybe bad. I, I don't know, depending on what it is, I suppose. But sometimes we act like we're one thing when we're really not. Uh, Solomon may have acted like with all this bravado, like he was a great man. Uh, but deep down, he had these insecurities. Uh, the Shulamite had these insecurities. And so in this book, we see uh, how... God gives us a way of dealing with our inadequacies, uh, with our insecurities. Uh, God gives us the ability to do whatever it is He's called us to do, but sometimes because of our background, our past, and the way that we think about things, we let our mind uh, uh, think about man's solution rather than God's solution. And when we go with man's solution, sometimes we can't overcome the things of this world. But with God's solution, if we apply them, then we can go to do great things for God. Uh, in Song of Solomon here, uh, we begin this week with the, the dreams here. Uh, she has a couple of dreams, uh, that kind of a two-part dream in this book. Uh, and she, she begins to dream here. Uh, and I, I believe these dreams are showing her subconscious feelings of inadequacy. I believe these dreams is about her feeling like she's unworthy. 
she's unworthy to be the queen, unworthy of Solomon, even though they're obviously they're married at this point. Uh, she still is not where she needs to be in life. And so how, how did you get there? Well, in her mind, she feels like that Solomon has abandoned her. You know, in life, we all need a cheerleader. We all need someone, oftentimes we need many people, to encourage us to do the right thing. You know, God tells me that one of my jobs as a believer is to edify others. And if I'm to edify others, to build others up, then that would simply mean that they need edifying. Uh, it also tells me that I need edifying. You know, we need to serve God no matter what. If all the world turns on us, we still have to do the right thing. But we have each other in this world. And our job should be to encourage one another, to build one another up in the faith, not try to, to let people down or destroy them. Uh, you know, we're, we're bad for that. Somebody once said that the Christian army is the only army that shoots us unwounded. And unfortunately, that's very often the case, most often the case. Somebody messes up, we abandon them. Uh, they're, they're no longer of any use to us. In our mind, God can't even use them sometimes. And obviously, that's not the case. If we all were abandoned because we messed up, we would all be completely abandoned. Uh, God will never leave us. God will never forsake us. And one of the ways that God builds me up is by sending people in my life to encourage me. I need encouragement, and, and, and you need encouragement. Uh, nobody can do this on their own. Uh, no man liveth on himself, and no one dieth unto himself. My life affects other people. Your life affects me. We affect each other, and we do need one another. And that's, that's why it's kind of a sad time that we're living in with the coronavirus, because we're not getting that encouragement from one from another. Uh, we're all uh, uh, in our homes, you know, maybe with our spouse, or maybe you have kids at home. Uh, but a lot of, you know, two, three people is all we have been in contact with for a month. Uh, and so we're not getting that encouragement. Um, you know, maybe it's time to send some postcards out or uh, to call somebody up, to send a text, send an email, uh, and sincerely, uh, be praying for that person. Uh, send a, a, a message of encouragement out to one another. Uh, we desperately need it. In the day and time we live in, uh, we, we need to be encouraged. Uh, this has been a long time, and it's probably going to be another month or more, for all we know, that we're going to uh, be separated from, from the world. Uh, well, I need encouragement. You need encouragement. We need a cheerleader. Uh, someone encourages someone to give us confidence. Someone to give us comfort when we're hurting. We need someone we can rely upon. Someone we can trust, a confidant that we can talk with and, and know that uh, they're not going to break that, that confidence we have with them. Uh, this is a lot of the, what the Song of Solomon is about. Uh, yes, it's about marriage, but... I think it's more than that. I think it goes out to friendships. Uh, definitely, we can, we can apply these principles to a lot of things in our life uh, that, that we need here. The first dream here, they're uh, in the, the marriage bed here, and apparently he gets up and, and walks out. Uh, it says in chapter 3, she said, By night on my bed I sought him whom I so loved. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now and go out about the city and the streets and in the broadways. I will seek him whom my soul loved. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchman goes about the city, found me. To whom I said, Saw you him whom my soul loveth? It was but a little that I passed from them. But I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go until I brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. So she goes out looks for him, finally finds him, and brings her back home. You know, why would she dream that he left? Well, maybe that's what she felt like deep down she deserved. Uh, maybe it's what she, she felt that feeling of inadequacy and thinking he deserves better than what he has here. Uh, if he leaves, I understand why he leaves. I mean, what, what's, what's going to keep him here? Uh, fortunately, in her dream, she does go out and find him. 
And in her dream, she does bring him, him back here, back home. Well, the second dream here, uh, she, he's out somewhere. Uh, this is, you know, obviously a little bit later on than the first dream. And he comes home one night, and she's in bed. Uh, she's not dressed, not ready to open up the door to him, uh, what have you. And he, he beseeches her to open up the door, but she's unwilling to get dressed. She's unwilling to, to answer the door. Now, that's, that's kind of a strange uh, attitude that she takes here. Uh, but again, remember, this is a dream. And so, in this dream, I believe what she's thinking here is that, uh, you know, it's going to reveal that, again, she's inadequate. And if she doesn't do everything perfectly, then he's going to leave her. She hesitates and calls him to leave. And so she finally gets up and she runs to the door hoping that she can catch him before he's gone. But it's too late. In chapter 5, uh, 4 and 5 here, uh, he's already gone. <clears throat> it says, My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. My bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my feelings with sweet smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved hath withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul uh, failed when he spake. I saw him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. She became frantic over his, his, his missing here. Uh, she searches for him. During her search, she even comes to the guards here. Verse 7 of chapter 5, The watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. Here she, in, in this dream, that because she didn't get up in time to open up the door, he left. Now she tries to find him and can't find him anywhere. If you remember in the first dream, she went to the watchman and, uh, you know, it was a good thing. Now she goes and they end up beating her up. Why is that? Why, why, why would she dream that? And I think it's because her subconsciously she feels like, again, she's unworthy. You know, she didn't do everything exactly right. He left. That's what I deserve. It's, it's my fault because I didn't answer to the door quick enough. It, it's my fault that I, I, I did this, therefore I get beat up. That's exactly in her mind that she feels like, well, this is exactly what I, I deserve. We have a lot of people in life that go through marriage in a situation like that. A, a wife abused by her husband. And he, he beats her, and then in her mind, well, it's not his fault. I, I didn't do this right. I didn't do that right. And it's just a sad, sad commentary on, on the human psyche about how do we can let other people defeat us in such a way when it's not our fault. And yet, in her mind, that's exactly what she feels. So she starts, they, they mistreat her, she begs for help in finding him. But fortunately, in chapter 6, it says, My beloved has gone down into his gardens to the, spices, and to the beds of spices to feed in the gardens and to gather the lilies. I am my beloved, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. She joyfully discovers his whereabouts. And so, you know, the dream does end up well at the end of this. But what we now have to understand is, we try to deal with why did she feel like this? And how do we overcome that? How do we overcome the feelings of insecurity that we have? I, I, I'm bad on myself sometimes, and even to this day, I've been saved 40 years this November, uh, and I'm, I'm very hard on myself. Uh, I have a lot of feelings of inadequacy. I have a lot of doubt about my abilities. And I, I grew up like that. I, I don't know why. Uh, I can blame it on other people, but really when it comes down to it, uh, it's just the way that I perceive life, I guess, um, in my own struggles, what have you. And it took a long time for me as a Christian. When I first got saved, I never believed that you could lose your salvation. I, I never thought about that. Even when I first got saved, I, I didn't know anything about Christianity. I didn't know anything uh, about the Bible as far as what it taught. Had not been in church uh, only a few times uh, when I was like six, seven years old. I didn't get saved until I was 22, something like that. Um, 
because all that time had not been in church. But I believed when you got saved, you got saved. And I believed in eternal security. Uh, but there was times in my, my mind I would doubt whether I was saved. Uh, my feelings were that I didn't get saved and lost it. It's just I never got saved in the first place. And the reason I never got saved, I felt like I never got saved in the first place because I don't deserve it. Uh, I'm not what I needed to be in life. I, you know, as a young Christian, I felt like that I should be basically perfect. And I wasn't. And I talked to other people sometimes and uh, asked them about their relationship. Oh, you know, when I got saved, things just fell into place. And, I, you know, things have been great and every day is a blessing. And I just don't have these problems I used to have. And then I look at my life and think, well, wait a minute, that's not the way I am. I still have problems. I still have doubts. I still have wrong thoughts. I still want to do the wrong things at times. They don't have these problems. I do. So it must be me. And therefore, it's not that uh, I lost my salvation. Apparently, I didn't get it in the first place. And there's even times in my, my mind I thought God loves everybody but me. So how did I overcome that? Well, it took a long time. Uh, and most of that is once I got into the Word of God and I found out what the Bible said. And the more I learned of the Bible, the more confidence I had as a believer. You know, one of the reasons uh, with the founding of the Bible College here is I believed very importantly that the more people knew about the Bible, the easier it would be for them to talk about the Lord and to witness to other people. And I, and I, I still believe that to be true. If we're ignorant of the Scriptures... We can't discuss the scriptures with people. Uh, they're not going to be at the, the uh, front of our mind. And so the more in-depth of the word we go. And so once I finally got the confidence of my security and my salvation, I think it came when I started practicing the word of God. When I started witnessing more. Uh, going out on visitation or witnessing people I worked with or, or whatever it might be. More, uh, I studied the Bible, read the Bible, and got the encouragement from God, from His Holy Word. That helped me. And then time got on, got a little bit more confidence, more confidence. And I like to say, there's times when I still feel inadequate. There's times when I still put myself down, uh, feeling like that I deserve uh, nothing in life. Uh, so what do I do? Get back into the Word of God. By encouragement. Here in the marriage here, uh, she finally gets to this place where she does find him. He's back with her. Now, how does she get to this point that she starts off as a slave girl in this book and ends up at the end of the book as a queen? How do you get there? Well, in marriage here, she needed help. She needed Solomon. She needed him to encourage her. Uh, why did he leave her? Well, in her mind, I'm not worth it. Uh, where did he go? And would he ever return? All these questions of an addict. She felt unworthy of being loved. Uh, and that's a very easy situation to get into. Uh, where we don't feel worthy of love. We don't feel worthy of, of anybody caring about us at times. And when we do that, we separate ourselves from, from people. And basically get out of the, the, where God would have us to be. So that's why it's so important that we, we gain our confidence through the Word of God. This is how that the Shulamite gets her, her confidence. Uh, the Song of Solomon has a lot of uh, verses here on encouragement. Uh, we have Sol Solomon here talking about this uh, Shulamite here. I want to look at some of these verses here. I'm not going to read all the verses. Uh, need to take time though and read through these very importantly. Uh, at the very beginning of the book, uh, when she feels so unworthy, he said, If thou know not, O thou fairest among women, go thy way forth by the footsteps of the flock. All thou fairest of women. He said, he encouraged her, first of all, such a beautiful woman. Verse 14. He said, My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the uh, vineyards of Engedi. Uh, her eyes were soft as doves' eyes. He said, Thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast doves' eyes. She was a lily among the thorns here in, in chapter 2, verse 2. <clears throat> uh, 
It says, as a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. See the encouragement that he gave here, the compliments that he gave her. Uh, chapter 4, it says, uh, Behold, thou art fair, my love. Behold, thou art fair. Thou hast dove's eyes. Again, he, he talks about that. Next part of the verse here, uh, some things just don't translate that well. Uh, you know, what we might think of as a compliment today, they might not have thought of that back then. And what they called as a compliment back then, boy, this is what he says. He said, Thou hast dove's eyes within thy locks. Thy hair is as a flock of goats that appear from Mount Gilead. Uh, it doesn't sound like much of a compliment, but in her mind it was. I mean, you know, it's kind of like, uh, what was the Commodore saying? She's a brick house. How's that a compliment in someone? But in the days and times we lived in, we understood that, that <laughs> she was a very attractive woman there in, in the song. Uh, well, you know, like I say, it may not look uh, in the Bible, these verses here may not seem like a compliment at the time, but uh, trust me, they did translate positively back in those times. Uh, her teeth, uh, says, are like a flock of sheep that are even shorn, which came up from the washing, where everyone bare twins and none is buried among them. It says, you have beautiful teeth and, and you got all your teeth too. That's, that's a good compliment, I suppose. Uh, Remember, these were uh, times where they didn't have the dentist like we have today. And so she, he, this is genuinely a, our compliments here. Uh, her lips like thread of scarlet. Uh, her neck was as stately as a tower of David. Uh, kind of a strange compliment here. But again, uh, talking about her just overall appearance and how uh, he felt about her. Her breasts were as trend fawns of a gazelle feeding among the lilies in verse uh, 5. Uh, two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. Uh, she was a lovely orchard bearing precious fruit. In verse 13, he said, Thy plants have an orchard of pomegranates with pleasant fruits, uh, camphor and uh, spikenard. Uh, she was a garden fountain, a well of living water. Her thighs were like jewels, the work of most skilled of a craftsman. Her navel was as lovely as a goblet. Uh, filled with wine, to be very uh, intimate uh, compliments here between the husband and wife. Her waist like a heap of wheat. <laughs> again, it doesn't translate very well, but uh, again, it, trust me, it, it is. Uh, her nose was shapely like a tower of Lebanon. I wouldn't try that on you know, your spouse and think, oh, you've got a nose like a tower of Lebanon. Wow, that's great. Uh, completely overcome, though, in verse 9 here of chapter 4, when he said, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse, Thou hast ravished my heart with one of thine eyes, with one chain of thy neck. Just one look, one single glance, he said, just kind of melted me. And so, what great compliments this is to her and how she begins to feel about herself. Uh, well, you know, by the end of the book, we do see that she has this great confidence about her. Well, what about Solomon? Uh, you know, it's easy for us to forget. Uh, maybe we don't have as much money as somebody else has, and uh, you know, people give to us at times to, to help out in time of need, but if somebody has money, uh, we don't give to them because, well, they don't need it. Uh, but remember, it's not about the gift. It's about the principle behind the gift. Uh, do you give things to people that have more money than you? Yeah, I think there's times when you do that. Uh, there's times when you're there because, it's again, it's not really the, the gift itself that's important. It's an attitude that you care about somebody. Uh, Solomon, he needed somebody to care about him. Uh, not just to compliment him, but somebody to truly care about him. And we see this. Uh, her description, the bridegroom's description of uh, of Solomon here. He was as swift as a young gazelle, uh, tanned and handsome, the fairest of 10,000. Uh, head was the purest gold, covered by wavy, raven hair. Uh, eyes were as doves beside the water brooks. Apparently that was a very common phrase back in those days between a man or a woman. Both uh, describe each other in that way. Uh, number five, his cheeks were like sweetly scented beds of spice. Lips were as perfumed lilies. 
uh, breath like myrrh. Arms was ground as barbed gold to uh, complement his physique here. Uh, bright ivory encrusted with jewels. Uh, legs, a very strong man, marble set in sockets. Countenance like Lebanon. Excellent as the cedars, the uh, famous cedar trees of Lebanon here. Uh, just compliment after compliment. Uh, he needed that. Uh, she needed that. And we do have this, this Shulamite who starts off with so much doubt about herself. By the end of the book, she believes she's a queen. And she believes that because she's been taught that by her husband. Encouragement, encouragement, encouragement. The dream she had, I believe, wouldn't go away. Because there would be no need for her to go out there and search for him. Because in her heart, she knew he wasn't going anywhere. Uh, how important is that? Uh, I, I can't stress that enough. Uh, and again, we all need it. We all need that encouragement one another. Uh, these days and times we live in, get, reach out to someone. Uh, maybe you don't feel like they need it, but who knows? I mean, how many times have you needed somebody and you didn't reach out to them? You didn't feel worthy to reach out, what have you? Maybe you know, we should do that if we need to. However, it's easy not to. Well, Put yourself on the other side. Uh, if you know at times you needed somebody, then you know that you can be there for somebody. So encourage one another. Uh, serve the Lord with, with full heart. Take His Word and apply it to your life. Then help others to apply it to theirs. But whatever it might be. And I like to say, a lot of some of you are going through some tough times right now. I don't know how many of you are without work. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure some of you are. I know some of you are. And it's a, just a day, tough days we're living in. Uh, well, we need people. Uh, God is there for us. We know, we know He will never leave us nor forsake us. But the way God deals with people is through people. So be available to God. Be available to be the encourager. Not just to get encouragement, but to be the encouragement. Thank you. We'll see you next week.